I have with me Jay Muse, uh, senior R&D uh, engineer from CR Bard. Ex uh, Essex Mitchell, he's the director of marketing from Stryker. And Kelly Schneiderman, senior global product marketing manager for Covidian. And uh, what I'm going to do is right now really just kind of turn it over to them, give them uh, a minute to give a brief bio of, of their um, positions expertise, as well as talk about what it, the challenges were for this year's NDEA uh, nominees. My uh, position at BART is to bring new products from nothing. Um, in fact, we don't have a group that um, incubates ideas and then brings them to, um, to the market. We actually... Um, uh, well, we don't have two separate groups. We have one group that does the entire thing, and, that, and that's my group. I primarily focus on thick lines. Those are those lines that uh, go in through the, uh, through the lower arm, the antecubital area, and make it up into the central part of the heart. And um, the product that we worked on was something completely new for, for BARD, and I think for the industry as a whole. So um, I think it'll be interesting to you. I'm a senior product manager at Covidian. Uh, we have our marketing group divided between upstream and downstream marketing, so I focus on the upstream side. Uh, developing products, working through the product development process, and uh, ultimately bringing them to market. Hello, my name is uh, Essex Mitchell from Stryker Medical, um, Director of Marketing for our Patient Handling and EMS groups. We focus both on the pre-hospital and the primarily acute care outpatient environment. So I'm responsible for both the upstream um, for new product development and uh, downstream kind of today focus uh, from a marketing perspective. I was neglecting to say that uh, Tor Alden, um, uh, moderating this panel from HSD, I was a juror for the 2013 MDEA Awards. It was a really, really, um, uh, really impressive uh, amount of uh, competition this year, and it's specifically uh, the amount of uh, existing companies that are, are uh, Fortune 400 and up companies really. Um, raising the bar from a, from a product category. And so innovation came up uh, quite a bit during the conversation and how, how groundbreaking technology will, will happen within existing organizations and how do they foster that uh, innovation through, through the system. So we're going to um, listen to, to their stories about their each case study and then afterwards we're going to talk and ask some questions relative to the actual uh, product breakthrough category. So, Jay? So I'm going to talk to you about Power Glide. It's a power injectable midline catheter. Um, for any of you that know anything about midline catheters, it's kind of the odd man out. So if you go into the hospital today, you either get a short little peripheral, and some of you have had those, I'm sure, or you get a real long catheter. Uh, we usually make the long catheters. Our company doesn't make the short catheters. The short catheter business is it's taken. It's uh, got three huge competitors. They do a fine job. And those catheters have a, a bit of an issue with them, though, and that is sometimes they don't last very long, and they're hard to insert. Not everyone, but some people are turned into human pincushions. So there are people who get poked 20 times, and if you can imagine, at 2 o'clock in the morning when they have to draw blood from you, if they have to make another poke, it hurts and it wakes you up. It's non-desirable. To alleviate that, you can put in a big long catheter, but the big long catheters are tough because they require a specialized team to insert them, and there are not many of them around. Or you can go into the IR, the interventional radiology, they can insert them there. It's expensive. So what they have a tendency to do is just continue to stick you until they get an access. Those are some of the patient types we're serving with this midline catheter that you just saw there. I'm going to give you an actual live demonstration of the product. This has been on the market now for about nine months. We're doing real well with it. I think it's, um, we're about 50% uh, ahead of projections. So um, it's, it's doing better than we thought. Uh, it looks like this, as you can see on the, the screen. And what the, the, the interesting thing about this is that it's actually a, th this one's a four inch long catheter. Now, if you were to hold this catheter, you'd want to hold it way, way back here because that's where the catheter ends. And that's difficult to insert, if you can imagine how difficult, look at my hand shaking, right? So there's no way I'd get in a vein. Now, if I'm, if I'm going to get close, then my, it's a lot more stable. I have a good shot of getting in a vein. So that's more like an IV insertion. So what we want to do is a midline catheter that inserts as easy as an IV. So IV ease of insertion, but with midline catheter performance. It's got a little guide wire, so I get in the vein, flash comes up just like an IV. I stick in the guide wire, I insert the catheter into the vein, 
I lock out the catheter, so now it's safety, there's no blood-borne pathogen issues, and then I have a blood control, so this stops the blood from coming out. When I'm ready to attach it, I pull it off, and now I have access to the catheter. So let's talk about innovation for a second. Things like this are, that are different for the, this is very different for the company. In fact, there are a lot of people that said, why are you going to go do this? Midline catheter market is some couple hundred thousand catheters. You'll make no money at it, even if you get the entire market. Well, the vision there is that you get the midline catheter market. But the, the vision there is you grow the, the midline catheter market. You make it huge. So, but you've got to prove it. And so the way we tried to prove it is we took the competitor's catheters, our catheters, and then we prototyped like crazy, and we set up a simulated use environment. And we gave what we called to the nurses, we gave them an eye test. Is this better or worse? Is this better or worse? Is this better or worse? What do you like? Is this better or worse? So in that way, you can take subjective information like sight to an objective measurement, like your prescription for your eyeglasses. Right? So you take subjective. Can you see it or not? To, yes, I'm a negative 3.25 diopter for my vision. It took about 13 iterations to get to this. And what this really is, is a catheter and a delivery system. It's two things, the catheter and the delivery system. Because again, what I said is, you've got to get the midline catheter in, but you've got to get it in using the less trained personnel and, 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 and rapidly. So here's some, since this is a, a manufacturing conference uh, primarily, I'll talk to you about some of the challenges that we have that you might be interested in, in terms of manufacturing and not necessarily innovation. So this is a picture of uh, the guide wire, the needle, and the catheter. And that position of the guide wire is extremely critical. So what we had to do is actually um, control the shrink rate of, a, of the part, that, the big, long, slender part. Now, we could have done insert molding. We could have done a lot of expensive things. But we actually have a part that has two different shrink rates. And we control that through time, temperature, pressure, standard stuff, but also in terms of how much we fill up the mold, if you're, if you're interested in the injection molding, using a closed-loop scientific injection molding process. Uh, this is also something that's critically important. It's called light distance. If the catheter is too far, it hurts going in. If it's too far back, you blow through the vein. Neither of them work, and this has to be carefully controlled. But there's a huge tolerance stack up that goes through there. So um, this was uh, interesting. Now, none of these needles can come out, so this has to work every single time for every catheter that we produce. And we came up with a very novel way of, um, of wicking glue into that surface and binding it and holding it tight. So it, it like self-wedges, if you want to call it. It's self-wedging effect. This is something that you wouldn't expect to be a problem, but we actually put barium inside the catheter. And if you know anything about barium, you know that it's hyperthrombogenic. So you don't want a th thrombogenic catheter because they occlude and they get thrombus all over them. So what we had to do is actually embed the, the uh, barium inside the two surfaces of the uh, extrusion. So imagine I've got a really thin catheter. Now inside that thin catheter, it's got three layers, a polyurethane layer, a barium stripe layer, and then another polyurethane layer. The problem with that is that you what's called branching. If you're an extrusion person, you'd, you'd, you'd know about branching. The problem with branching is that that causes a rough surface, and the rough surface actually fails our thrombogenicity tests. So we were able to solve that problem as well. Here's a problem uh, that uh, it, it, it's a big old mechanism. Let me cut the chase here, though. Um, silicone is used to plug the catheter, like I told you. But um, the problem with silicone is that if you uh, hyperextend the silicone and you put it through a, um, uh, um, a, a sterilization cycle, it will actually sometimes hold the same shape. But through some design and some careful selection and modification of the silicone that we're using, um, we're getting a really good um, seal on that valve performance. And so um, picking that silicone and getting the design just right, uh, it, was, it was quite a bit of a challenge. And this is the last one. This is interesting. When we overmold our catheters, so we have a catheter, we put it in the mold, and then we, we overmold on top of that. And what was happening in the overmolding process is that the, uh, as you overmolded it, the hot polyurethane that came in would mix with that thin catheter and cause it to wrinkle and kind of churn up. Well, they all leaked, and so we didn't have a product. But what we, what we did here is that we went to a 95 to a 98% fill, and then we did the pack and hold. So I'm not going to tell you any of the other details. You have to figure those out for yourself. But um, uh, it, it, there is a way that you can do it if you're ever having that kind of a problem where you're having two, you want two things to melt together, but you don't want them to melt together to the point that it causes a, a, a destruction of the part you're trying to bond to. So if you're a molding person, that would be of interest to you. So anyway, that's it for me. Your, your, your device was a highly uh, technical engineering challenge, it seemed. Yet you're in a ground, groundbreaking um, market. How does your marketing and engineering group work together to collaborate on, on bringing that to market? 
Uh, yeah, that's uh, the answer to that is really well. Um, I worked initially, I was the first person that this got assigned to. Uh, we had no engineers available. And so I worked with our marketing person, Little Ginster, and what we did is we hit the road. So the two of us uh, conspired together to try to convince the organization, which is really quite difficult, to go off and design this catheter. Um, like I said, Bard Access Systems in Salt Lake City has never designed anything internally in its history. They buy stuff. They buy and they develop it. And sometimes when you buy stuff, you get a good deal. And sometimes when you buy stuff, you don't. And so we had a fairly good rate, but not a great rate. Because you know what happens when you buy something? Sometimes the guy you buy it from is just a really good salesperson, right? It's not that the product has actually been developed to the point that they say that it is. And so then it's up to us to make it work. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can. But in this case, we developed it from scratch, from nothing, uh, from a blank sheet of paper. And uh, Little Ginster's the marketing person's name, by the way. And we just spent a lot of time talking to clinicians and with prototypes in our hands. Okay, next we have Kelly Schneiderman. He's going to talk to us about the Sonicision uh, cordless ultrasonic dissection system. Thanks, Tor. So first of all, before I begin, I just want to thank uh, the MDEA team for inviting us up here. It's truly an honor uh, to represent not only our companies, but the products that are finalists in this year's competition. Uh, the results are going to be announced later this afternoon, so of course we're all uh, anticipating a positive outcome for our products. So I'm going to be speaking about uh, a device called the Sonicision Ultrasonic Dissection System. I'll explain a little, bit more, a little bit more about what that product is in just a minute. But before I begin, uh, I just want to start with uh, Covidian's Integrity, Honesty, uh, Safety, and Quality Statement, and I'll just read it out loud. We will conduct business with integrity and honesty and compliance with all laws and company policy. We are committed to produce products that are safe and of the highest quality for our customers. I always like to start presentations with that. Um, we hold uh, ethics and, and product quality at a very high standard at Covidian, and so that was integral in the development of the Sonicision device. So rather than trying to describe the device myself, I have a short animation video that I'm going to show now. Uh, which I think will nicely summarize it and, and help me uh, explain some of the innovative features of the device. So 
You saw a few things in that video that I'll touch on uh, in the next couple of minutes. This is a picture of our system. Uh, you can see that we have the device which you saw in the video, the sterilization tray, uh, as well as our battery charger. Um, one thing that I want to point out is uh, our battery and generator are both reusable 100 times. That was a major uh, design feat for us, trying to design a product that could be re-sterilized 100 times to reduce the per, uh, per procedure cost of the device. Um, whereas the uh, single-use part that goes into the patient uh, is used one time and then disposed. So in this picture, we actually submitted this with our, uh, with our MDEA submission. You'll see on the right-hand side of the picture here, this is the Autosonics platform that was actually in 2000 an MDEA silver medalist uh, in this competition. You can see that it has quite a large footprint. It takes up uh, quite a, a large share of the, uh, the operating room theater. In contrast, kind of juxtaposed uh, to that, is the Sonicision system here, which is the cordless device um, that is in this year's submission. Um, one additional thing as well is there are three cords on the Autosonics platform, one plugging the system in to the wall, one connecting the handpiece, which is sitting on the Mayo stand there, on the blue stand, um, connecting the instrument to the generator, and then another for an optional foot pedal. So with the Sonicision system, we were actually able to remove all three cords from the operating room and contributing to a safer OR experience as well. Our value proposition is pretty important to this platform. Uh, we went out and spoke to many, many customers and many stakeholders in the development of this project. Uh, it's no longer sufficient to develop clinically relevant products. They need to be economically viable as well. So uh, free from tethered design that limits range of motion, of course, our cordless design. Uh, freedom to focus on the patient, not on the device. That refers to our dual mode activation button, uh, which is an innovative feature and proprietary to our design. Freedom from time-consuming setup. You saw in the video how quick and easy it was to set up the device. That's uh, a major feature for our nurses, our scrub nurses that are actually setting up the device in the OR theater. Freedom to experience faster dissection and less visual obstruction. Those are two of the clinically, uh, clinically relevant innovations of this device that are, of course, critical to, uh, to using it in surgery. And finally, freedom from non-upgradable larger capital investments. Capital equipment like the Autosonics platform that you saw in the picture are quite expensive and quite expensive for the biomedical department, for example, to maintain. So we've eliminated all of those things with our cordless design. So now I'm going to speak briefly about some of the design elements that actually went into creating the product and some of the, the things that we submitted to the MDEA uh, judging committee for, uh, for this competition. First, this is our jaw design. We spent a lot of time optimizing this um, to uh, make sure that we had faster dissection than what was available in the market and also the geometry of our blade to reduce the surgical plume that's created. So when, uh, when ultrasonic energy, which, uh, which is where the blade vibrates at 55,000 times per second, uh, is used on tissue, it creates a surgical plume or a surgical mist. Uh, that linear active blade actually minimizes, uh, minimizes that mist and the direction of, of that plume uh, to, uh, to increase the visibility in the surgical field for the surgeon. Next we have the reusable generator. This is essentially the core technolo technological element of the product. There's one feature here that I really think uh, is the most innovative and it's my favorite to point out to people. You can see the, uh, the pogo pin uh, feature right here, uh, as well as the slip rings, those gold uh, bands that go on the generator, uh, on, on the uh, transducer rather portion of the device. So, when the device is rotated with a cord, that cord comes out of the back of the transducer. And if you think of a vacuum cleaner that's plugged into a wall, if you try and coil that cord, it's going to kind of twist up and get all knotted up. So by having this feature where the generator actually makes contact with the transducer via these, uh, via these pogo pins making electrical contact, it allows the device to be rotated infinitely um, without losing connection. And that's essentially core to the, the, freedom, uh, the freedom value proposition that we have of the device. 
and the last design element that I want to speak to is uh, our flex circuit. This is one of the components that essentially allows us to maintain the ergonomic form of the device. Uh, you see that we have the buzzer, which is that orange dot um, that's on the single-use handpiece of the device. Uh, we also have the connection to the generator and to the battery pack. And so you saw in the previous picture when it's all assembled, it all has to connect. The battery needs to be able to provide power to the generator, which then needs to trans, uh, transmit that power through the, uh, the transducer, which is in the shaft of the device, to the active blade to, to, um, to offer the tissue effect to the surgeon. So lastly, our, our user interface is really core to making this a simple design, which is, I think, uh, what contributed to, to making us a finalist in this year's competition. We took all the words and the messages and the, and the verbal cues out of the, the product design. We spent a lot of time optimizing um, the user interface here where all user information is communicated via simple colors and tones. So the combination of colors and tones tells the user that everything is functioning normally, that something is wrong, that the battery is low, for example. Uh, it's all communicated through the light on the generator and the tones that are emitted from the device directly. So next I want to speak briefly about um, one of the other products that's actually a finalist in this year's competition, uh, the iDrive Ultra powered stapling system. Covidian is one of uh, only a, a few companies this year that has more than one finalist product. And ironically, the Sonicision system and the iDrive system are uh, both competing within the same category. and so. Uh, internally, we have a uh, you know we have a little wager on who's buying drinks tonight, and uh, you know selfishly I hope that that's the Sonicision system. But um, you know we have a team here that's representing iDrive Ultra, so I want to talk a little bit about their device as well. So you can see here you have uh, the system. One of the uh, one of the innovative features here is that the handle and the shaft up until the the reload, the single use reload, are all reusable. So. The, uh, the entire handle assembly is autoclaved, uh, and it can be reused up to 50 times. And the battery pack can actually be recharged over 300 times. And so again, coming back to the economically viable statement that I mentioned earlier, it's really important to, uh, to not only touch on the clinical side of things um, and provide that clinical innovation, but also make sure that the product is economically viable to be adopted in the face of, uh, of the changing healthcare system. So, the iDrive Ultra uh, system is the first actually fully powered reusable endo stapling system. Key here is that the entire device can be operated with just one hand. And by operating the device with just one hand uh, versus in uh, manual staplers where you need two hands to actually operate uh, the articulation of the device and the firing of the device, the surgeon now has an extra hand that's freed up uh, where he can use the, uh, the other instruments in the procedure to manipulate tissue all at the same time. These next three, I'm going to uh, kind of lump together, but uh, placing the stapler in the exact right location is something that's core to the powered stapling system. Um, and it's that extra precision that you get with the powered stapling system that I think makes this device unique. Uh, you can rotate the device um, 360 degrees and you can articulate it so that you essentially get unlimited points of articulation as you rotate and articulate at the same time. Uh, and then, of course, the firing of the device. Um, you can imagine that in surgery, when you're near sensitive structures, it's very important to have a precision and, and place the device uh, very precisely. So having this powered firing mechanism uh, allows the device to, um, to have a, up to 61% reduction uh, in the motion at the tip of the device. So that's all I have. Thanks for your time. And I'll pass it back to Tor. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I do have one question for you. Um, so you talk a lot about um, time and saving and, and uh, adding simplicity to the user. Can you add a little bit more about the design and how it translates, some of that design translates to other, uh, beyond the user, voice, you know, market share, profitability? How, how, does, how does your organization work with these other departments to justify the balance between uh, user needs and, and profitability? Sure. So one of the 
uh, one of the submission criteria for the MDEA awards was actually to look beyond just the direct device innovation itself and focus on how our device design helps the healthcare system overall, but also helps Covidian as a company. And so some of the things that I think the Sonicision system uh, contributes to internally as a company, um, we're able to produce products that are smaller, uh, that have a smaller footprint in our manufacturing area, um, that are lower cost to manufacture. Uh, and then in turn to the healthcare system, we're able to offer those products at, at lower uh, acquisition cost to our customers. And I think that's critical, again, as I mentioned in the presentation, um, to, uh, to the, health, uh, the changing healthcare environment right now. Well, so I'm going to introduce Essex Mitchell from Stryker. Uh, this is the Stryker Prime TC transport chair that was nominated as a MDAA finalist for 2013. Great. Well, similar to echo some of Kelly's thoughts, I really want to say thank you to the MDEA for um, honoring us and um, selecting us as a finalist. We're really excited for to see where we land tonight, but um, I really want to <clears throat> walk through a few thoughts uh, with regard to our Prime TC uh, transport chair. This is a a new product for us, um, but it really fits within the same value proposition that our organization uh, moves towards, which is simplifying healthcare delivery through safety and efficiency. And there's three words within that sentence that we really focus on, which are simple, safe, and efficient. That uh, That's the bar that all of our products need to meet in order to, uh, to hit the street um, from a striker bag. So why a transport chair? And a lot of people see this and they'll think of a, of a wheelchair. And um, we purposely talk about it, a transport chair, because this is one of the first chairs that was, or if not the only chair, that was specifically designed for the healthcare environment. The, the traditional wheelchair was not, it was used for self-propulsion, and uh, this is a product that um, we thought we could reinvent and really look at how this market uh, could be a little bit different. So, we have a strong legacy with patient transport, but it's typically in the, in the supine or, or lateral position. Um, since 1941, our organization um, was founded uh, on a product that had wheels on it from Homer Stryker, which our company's named after. And through the years, we really set out to reinvent this market over and over as we launch new products to enhance mobility, enhance um, you know, people's dignity and the comfort that they have as they um, lay on a product, one of the most usable products that you'll see in the healthcare environment from the uh, outpatient environment, but also uh, through some of the procedural areas and as they transition onto sometimes some of our med surge beds. So what we, we look to do through this process is really see how we could um, really invent, reinvent this product that uh, looks pretty similar to the product that's around today, and it's the patent hasn't changed, and the product hasn't changed since 1933. And so if you look at a product of pretty close to today, you'll see the, the current wheelchair in the middle there uh, is very similar to that, that black and white grainy photo that, that you see there. And more recently, we've seen a few rigid chairs that um, have really focused on functionality, but not so much on design. And that's what we've uh, really tried to marry it to because we understand the changing environment with reimbursements and patient satisfaction and how all those things really impact healthcare organizations and the dignity and the, the pride that someone wants to feel when they're in a healthcare environment or at least have the perception that they're being cared for as opposed to being just treated and, and shipped back out. So we, we really set out to really uh, make a mark on this on this product. So we believe that you know, launching a Prime TC that marries design and form and function together and really uh, puts some of the, the best in class features and the striker durability and really allows us to start a revolution that will allow us to really own that entire continuum of uh, transport within the healthcare facility, not only in the supine or lateral position, but also in the seated position. So we didn't do this alone and we, we came together with a really um, world-renowned designer and uh, Michael Graves. He's designed uh, all kind of products. He's really famous for a, a nice teapot that uh, seems like someone knows uh, about, but uh, the Alessi teapot and has designed a, a number of buildings and casinos all around the world in Macau and in uh, China and, and is really world-renowned for his design work and he has a, a, a really strong um, group that's right up the road here in, in Princeton, New Jersey. 
and uh, he's worked with uh, not only us, but he's really known for his work with Target. You'll see his, his products were all over there, and more recently he's moved to work with JCP or the old JCPenney, um, where soon they'll have a, a store within the store. So we were beyond uh, fortunate to not only work with Michael because of his uh, design prowess and, and his organization's prowess, but also um, because you know Michael has suffered a um, pretty debilitating uh, disease that has confined him to a, a wheelchair. Also, it wouldn't not a chair like we're selling today or looking at today, but it's it's. Uh, when he went through that process, uh, healthcare became a passion, and we were fortunate that Stryker was the organization of his choice that he chose to work with. So when we looked to do this, you know, we said why in the beginning. We looked at a wheelchair, and we went all over the all over the world, primarily the developed market um, in the United States, Canada, and and Western Europe, because that's where we believe the the primary market is. Uh, for this, and so we went out and did VOC or voice a customer, and and kind of observed and, and seen, and we came up with some rapid prototypes, and then we went back out and talked to some of those same customers and a few new ones again to really get a, a better perspective of um, how we could really reinvent this market and really get a better perspective of um, what design features and what functionalities could we really improve on moving forward. So working with Michael Graves, and they really helped us uh, through this process get a more uh, consumer or customer-driven approach as opposed to a feature engineering-driven approach with regard to design. And we looked at it from two different perspectives. How does the interaction between the caregiver and the chair occur? And what we found is there's a lot of hunching over. You know those two breaks that go on there. We see people doing the break dance, and the customers are getting up, and and our patients are trying to get up and, and get out before the chair is in a safe position, and um, people are in, in people's laps as they're trying to help them to lift legs up, and it's it's not the the, the best process, I would say, and um, it wasn't too dignified, and we really set out to improve that, and we really wanted to see what the patient's perspective was as as they sat in the wheelchair, and we saw there was a lot of uh, removable parts and. A lot of things that were missing and rusty, and there's infection control challenges, and we really set out to uh, give a, a better product to them also, so that as they come into the healthcare facility, once again, they can feel like they're being cared for as opposed to being treated, and in the end, actually have a better patient satisfaction, which reaps a financial reward, obviously, for the healthcare facility. So we categorized everything we learned into different sections about the product, whether it was an um, intangible or tangible thing about the current wheelchair and the current wheelchair market, and we categorized it, and we found that this is really where we have the opportunity to redefine this market. And we focus on what all of our products do under three stakeholders, which were the healthcare organization, the caregiver, which have been a, a huge focus for us in the past, and also the patient. And so we see that, you know, you look at infection control, which is a, a major challenge in, in any healthcare organization. Uh, we set out to make cleanability in a product that is really easy to, to manage from that perspective. We wanted movable parts, but not removable parts. So you never were running around looking for something. And you talk about that last word, efficiency. Uh, if you're always looking for parts, you're not too efficient in moving your patients to the procedures and getting them back home and out of the hospital probably like they would like to be. So um, from the patient perspective, I don't know what that is. From the patient perspective, there's a ingress and egress um, feature that you'll see here in a couple slides that really gives a clean path. About 50% of all patient falls happen with the interaction of a wheelchair. So we know that patient falls can be really detrimental not only to the hospital's bottom line, but to the patient. And when people break hips, it's, there's not typically a, a good outcome after that. And the ergonomics for the caregiver, we really have a, a strong expertise in this from our, from our stretcher portfolio. We understand ergonomics. We understand um, where people's power zone are and what type of features and um, geometry of wheels will really help um, move and turn products at, at, their, at their finest. So we went through over 150 design loops, and you'll see some rapid prototypes and some things where um, we started learning things over time, and uh, ultimately we came up with the product that you see there on the right. And so once we came up with that, we really felt we had something that could redefine the, the not only just patient transport, but the seated transport. And when you combine that with our our stretcher portfolio, we really felt that we really were in a great position to uh, 
help the organization, help caregivers, and help patients really be comfortable and uh, simple, safe, and efficient products throughout the entire continuum of care as they enter into a healthcare facility. So a couple of the specs, we have a 500 pound capacity on the product, which you'll see that'll accommodate about 85 to 90% of the patients you'll see, there's still going to be a, a small need for some of the bariatric patients or specialty chairs. But what you'll see there is that uh, the chair width and the, the seat height are all some of the standards that you'll see with some of the chairs that you're sitting in or other products that are in the, in the uh, hospital environment. So with a positive patient experience, what you'll see here is that uh, we have flip away or swing away uh, foot rest. Um, you'll see a, a leg rest here. Um, you'll see things that, that aren't on other products that allow you to get closer to cars, closer to other products, closer to the, to the patient. They're all movable but not removable. This flip up foot rest right here which you'll see is uh, spring loaded so they're in the up position always and they're only down when there's weight. So that ensures that once the patient takes their feet off they can get in and out without a trip hazard that you currently have. And it also works with infection control because that patient doesn't have to bend down or that caregiver in the lap and move that with their, with their hand and, and really invade the patient's privacy. One other really thing from an engineering perspective that I probably would be in trouble if I didn't show, they were really proud of this, and uh, they should be, is that what you'll see is that um, I talked about the breakdown. You see some of the other rigid frames, and these products are in all kind of different environments. They go out in the elements, they're in parking lots, they're in the hospital, and they're going in and out. And with that, we wanted to you know, keep um, a robust brake system that is a one touch, that is caregiver access only, but also not really compromise the design quality of the product, you know, and, and really keep that sleek, um, positive aesthetic that we were looking for when developing the product. So we enclose this into the foot support, uh, or the, the wheel support seat rest, and um, there was a lot of debate over this process, but we really feel good with what we came out with, and we have a, a great brake system that is, is accessible but did not compromise our, our design process. We also have nesting. We know space is always a concern in any uh, hospital environment. So what we did is uh, found a way to create the chair in a, a geomet uh, geo geometric fashion that allows them to get a little bit closer and be very similar to uh, what you'd see as a wheel the standard wheelchair set up next to each other inside of a, a waiting room. And lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about innovation. We focused. Uh, We've been focused on innovation for a long time. A lot of it's been, if it wasn't designed at Stryker, it doesn't belong at Stryker. And what we learned is that um, there are a lot of other great organizations to partner with. And obviously, we had the opportunity to, to partner with Michael Gray's, but we also work with the Doblin organization um, as a corporation. And they're really taking us through a new process and a new way of thinking. And that's called the 10 Types of Innovation. Some, some of you may be familiar with it. But it, it causes you to think about innovation, not just from a product perspective. They talk about from configuration, offer, and experience. And configuration is probably a more of an internal innovation. How can we um, innovate our processes and our, um, our way of uh, doing business with our customer? Uh, offering is really focused solely uh, on the actual product. What can we do to improve the product? And experience is how do we impact our, our customers, and in this case, our, our patients or our caregivers' experience with the product. So what you'll see is that there'll be 10 types across the board here. And um, what the Doblin Group, how they measure that is that if you have one to two types, they'll say that you are kind of doing a core innovation or kind of a, a single in baseball, if you will. And if you have uh, three to four, it's about an adjacent market and it, you might have hit a, a double, um, maybe, a, maybe a triple. It's a, an adjacent uh, innovation. If you have five or plus, you hit a home run there and it's a, a game-changing innovation. And so we were able to work with them with this product and run it through their filter. And we were really excited to see that we believe that we have a game-changing product here that's really going to flip the, uh, what, what was the wheelchair market into the seated transport market on its head. And um, you see we've hit across all three uh, spectrums of configuration, uh, product, and experience. So at the end of the day, what, what we feel great about is that this product is a very, um, 
fits right in line with our value proposition. Uh, simplicity, we believe, is the ultimate sign of elegance and innovation. Uh, safety, we, we expect to raise the bar with the expectation of seated transport and what safety looks like, specifically from fall prevention. And efficiency, having everything on the chair. You never have to look for it. All the parts are always there. Everything you need is um, always with you. Really, we believe, will increase efficiency. And so what I have here is a, a quick video and animation uh, to close everything. Um, just to show you a couple of the other features that I didn't speak to and it kind of gives you a little bit of the story of how we impact the uh, continuum of care with, um, with our seated and our lateral transport products. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity. Essex, one question for you. You mentioned you had three customers. You had your patients, your healthcare uh, organization, and your caregivers. In designing a product like that, which is going to be typically more of a high cost than a traditional wheelchair, um, I guess the question is, you must have come across some challenges in the development and some roadblocks that may have killed that innovation along the way. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um Throughout the process, we've uh, we went through a number of iterations and uh, presentations and proposals to our, our leadership and our organization. And there were times where we felt, do we really want to do this? And are we going to be able to uh, bring enough value to charge with this product? Uh, we're going to have to charge. And similar to a lot of the other products in our portfolio, we really take a differentiated stance with um, all of our products and we sell on value. We do try to deliver value to our customers. And what we heard back from our voice of customer and our customer preference testing is that we, we did meet that bar. And, and early signs show that, um, that customers are responding to it. It's not the chair for every single healthcare provider, but those folks that are concerned about um, you know, their patient's experience and their, their perception of their organization and the, the perception of the quality of care that they're giving, as well as getting some tangible things as far as reducing falls and infections, um, really have uh, responded well to it. I do want to talk a little bit about um, what it means to be an MDEA finalist and how you, as a panelist, are, really can maybe talk a little bit more about what, um, what do you think it means to what is groundbreaking and, and what, what makes your device or any device that's a finalist really um, become an MDEA uh, winner or a finalist? And maybe I'll start off with you, Jay. Sure. Um, yeah, what does it mean to be groundbreaking? Uh, you know what? Uh, an invention is an invention, and innovation has maybe some value with that invention. And I think to be groundbreaking, that's what you need to provide is value through something that you've created and thought, and thought through. So, you know, in our case, um, what we were really trying to prevent was needle sticks, pain to the patient. Um, and not only pain, to tell you the truth, if you get enough needle sticks in your arm, you can actually destroy the vasculature so that um, needle sticks in the future become a lot more difficult. They, they actually find this with drug, drug addicts. So, um, yeah, that, I think that's what we were all about, reducing pain to the patient. Get a catheter in that'll last, you know, 20, 30 days instead of a catheter that leaves it lasts a day and a half. So if you've ever had an IV catheter or lots of them, you know what I'm talking about. Um, we had an intern that uh, 
uh, during the project actually, about a month into the project, she had, I think it was 13 needle sticks and actually suffered a delay in therapy because the doctor wasn't in or the specialized nurses were not in to insert the midline catheter that it was needed or the pick line. Um, so she could have used this device. And I've actually talked to uh, patients who have thanked me personally for inventing something like this. Of course, I didn't. It was a, an engineer who works for me who invented most of it. But um, who thanked me because uh, of the fact that she had gone through tons and tons of IV catheters and this was actually very nice that she could have a catheter in for nine, ten days ac across the course of her therapy. So I think that would be considered groundbreaking. A midline catheter placed like an IV, not a bad idea. So. I'll expand. I'll expand on what Jay said. A design is, is a design. I think that with the device that I described, the Sonicision system, I believe that we've hit that design out of the park and we have a home run with that design from a user ergonomics perspective, from a device performance perspective. But to me, what, what makes an MDA finalist uh, a winner is taking into account all of the stakeholders um, that are involved with that product. So for example, in our case, we have surgeons, we have nurses, we have the biomedical engineering department, we have the purchasers in the hospital, we of course have the patient, um, and we have our internal company and the objectives that we have as a, as a publicly traded organization. And so considering all of those stakeholders in the design of the product, I think is, um, is what makes uh, our device a winner. Yeah, I, I would say that um, what it means to be an MDA finalist. It's a really uh, a proud moment for our organization, and it's a celebration of a, uh, a number of people coming together. It's um, from the excellent groups that we work with, with Michael Grays, but also the, uh, the engineers who've done a lot of the, uh, the functional design of the product and really brought it together. And unfortunately, they all couldn't be here. I don't wish they could, but it's a very um, you know, humbling moment that they have here. And we're fortunate that the MDEA finalists, is, is, we're not a newcomer to this, and it's been an indicator for us for um, some product success. Recently, we, from our EMS division, we had our power load product that, that won the award also. And we were, uh, and, and it was a great indicator of the type of success that we'll have in the future and that we've hit the mark. And, and the mark that we achieve is empowerment and empowering our caregivers to do their job in a simpler, safer, and more efficient fashion. And so um, if this is the same type of indicator, uh, moving forward, it's a uh, it's it's a great honor for us to, to be here. Uh, thank you for uh, that.